quite a big topic that I hope to be un unpacking in the next two, three weeks. And um, I am a recovering addict. So you're definitely not speaking to someone that's got this all down, but I've got a desperate need to get this down. And I've wrestled with God and what I've, what has transpired of this wrestling, I would love to share with you. I think there's a little bit of feedback on the mic. If we could maybe just get it down a bit, I will, I will speak loud enough. Um, so I'm a recovering addict and I realized that I need to find new ways of thinking. I, I had a rough two years. It was amazing because a lot of my dreams came true. But the thing with the dreams are that they're very romantic before you actually get to live them. But when you get to live them, you realize they were so important to you that you're so scared to mess them up now that you end up in a very bad space because you're living your dream. And uh, so it's good to have your dreams, but just know that um, it's sometimes at the, they're at the best when they are still only a dream. So I am uh, rewiring, and, and, and this, this is not a quick fix for most of us. For most of us who've been living in this world and who, who's struggling with, certain, with, with varying amounts of stress and anxiety in our lives, and this, I've been doing my pastoral duties, I've figured out that it's most of us. Um, so I'm not speaking to uh, unfortunate 10 of you uh, while the rest of you are in La La Land, but on our way to La La Land, um, we, we are going to walk through this little process and, and I'm rewiring my mind and it's been such a long time coming, such a long um, history of not, of not plugging into this and of believing things that is not conducive to the peace of God. Um, that has led me to a place of, um, I would say, very close to, or if not com complete emotional burnout with, with all of its all of its stuff. And I've I couldn't understand what's happening to me. And I've tried to uncover what on earth is going on. And I've come to the realization, and uh, with some help, we need help sometimes. That uh, this is the problem. And now I'm seeing it everywhere. So I'd like to speak a bit on it. Um, like I said, I've got some, I've been wrestling with God and he's faithful and giving me amazing revelations that I want to share. And I'm trusting as you, as I hope you would be for this grace and the wisdom of God to apply these. Because this sermon will not change us. Charismatic Christians, we like to believe in the um, power of supernatural ministry like we just had and that is very powerful um, but there is a place of rewiring our minds of setting our minds on things above on thinking about certain things as scripture commands us and 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 that is a journey and not just an event but praise god for events that kicks off journeys amen um, the first thing is that we, we feel like victims often to, to things like anxiety and stress. It feels like it's happening to me and I'm a victim of it. And that's probably been one of the major revelations to me is the fact that I'm not a victim to it. I am a sinner because of it. Um, and we'll explore that more, but that actually gives us the power to do something about it because we're not just hopeless in it. So we'll speak about that a little bit, but um, sometimes we're even anxious because we want good things to happen and we think it's worth it. We'll explore why even this is not a reason to be anxious. And we know we will face many stresses in life, major stresses. If you would read up on anxiety, the, the very first thing, if you go on Google, I did it many times, to see what, what you should do to get rid of this, you know, of this burnout, or whatever. And the first thing is they say, remove this stressor from your life. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
I just have the answer. I'm going to go on a five-year sabbatical to Mauritius. Problem sorted. Um, unfortunately, that's unfortunate worldly advice that will not do you uh, well. Because as a Christian, my dear friend, you are promised. It is, it is, it is, it is sure, a sure thing that you will encounter hardships and tough times. And the more you follow him, the deeper that inner peace needs to grow because the more intense the outward circumstances can become. And so we cannot chase after removing the stresses, but the Bible teaches a way to perfect peace regardless. So we'll be digging into what I found in scripture. And um, what we're going to do today is a, a rather well-defined, and I'm not a three-step, kind of a preacher but for those of you who like three-step preachers i'll be one today but there's a very nice three-step process in scripture that's been helping me a lot and we're going to unpack that a bit and we're hopefully going to do that a bit also the three steps um, is linked to the word command number one number two action plan Number three, promise. Scripture often works like this. There's a command. And there's an action plan on how to do this command. And then there's a promise for if you would or would not adhere to the command. And um, so keep that in mind as we go. Our first scripture. And I'll be sharing little inserts, revelations that I've um, obtained and I believe through the Holy Spirit on each of these scriptures as we work through the specific process. First scripture, Psalm 37, verse 8, the second part of it. Psalm 38, verse 7, the second part of it from the Amplified. It says, do not fret. It leads only to evil. To fret. For us Afrikaans people, we need to Google things like this to make sure that we know exactly what's going on. Because like in my mind, a fret is, you have on the guitar, you've got many frets. Um, and I do fret there. But I shouldn't fret, okay, because it leads to evil. So I mean, obviously fret means I'm like, do not, it's like murder, you know, or it's um, swearing. <laughs> do not fret. It leads only to evil. So I did Google and I found that a uh, Google dictionary says that it is to be constantly or visibly anxious. So I said, aha, that's, that's, that, that's the topic I'm going to preach on so I can use the scripture. I understand anxiety more than fretting. Um, and it's that nagging anxiety that we, that we sometimes sit with. And, and so we recognize that the word, this is the word of God that says very clearly, do not. And we'll see this a couple of times, but it's not a suggestion, is it? It's not a, it would be, it would be better for you if you don't fret. It says don't fret. Now we have a good father in heaven who knows what is good for us. And as a parent, you tell your child, don't do that. It's going to harm you. And in the same way, and we'll see this a couple of times, it's a commandment. Now, as Christians, how do we respond to commandments? It's not suggestions we evaluate. It's things we need to obey. And when we do not obey them, we can freely repent about it and have a change of heart and say, Oh God, I haven't been submitted, submitting to this, but I dearly now want to because your spirit has worked in me. And therefore... I repent of this and I, I pray that you would lead me. And so from that place, it seems that our anxiety is, is completely unwanted, even by the most high. And one of the beautiful things that God has taught me, and it's a discernment that he has allowed me to have that I'd like to pray over you too, but... Because I've realized that this is not something I'm victim to that just happens to me, but it's something that, that 
as sin comes, it comes with a temptation. It's that email that lands in your inbox, that WhatsApp that comes to your phone, that, that, that conversation you have with someone, that thought about something you forgot about that's due tomorrow, that those are temptations to worry. They do not mean because they have just happened, thou art to worry now. And that's what I've done. The email came. I don't want to look at my inbox because I mean, there's, there might be a couple of things that's gonna, it's just gonna break me. And I don't want to, I'm scared of my WhatsApps. I'm addicted to my phone, but I'm also, I'm also scared of it. It's like the worst relationship ever. It's like, shucks, if I see a WhatsApp from, and I feel I've got no, I've got no choice. I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to be anxious about this now because it just happened to me. And God has showed me now that there's a process in between this where it's almost like a ball that's being passed to you. And I see this ball is coming from the evil one, from my own evil, evilness, that comes to me and says, here is something to be anxious about. And I can look at it. And if I know this is a command from scripture, what a beautiful command. It seems impossible to obey, but it will work on that. Do not be anxious. Then I see the ball coming. I literally see like a little round thing coming. Or not literally, but in my mind. It comes. And I smile at it. And I say, no. I will not be anxious because of you. And I smile and I release a lot of amazing hormones. And I feel better about it. And then I pass the ball. And I forward the email. To the one who said I should forward it to him. We'll speak about that. And when I do accept that anxiety. And when I've caught the ball. And the ball's hot. And it's burning. And I don't know what to do with the ball. And the ball. I mean I'm going to handle this ball. But I don't know how. I'm just going to be worried about it. And say God help me. God help me. He says just give me the ball. God help me. God help me. Just give me the ball. No, God help me. You know? Because um, I need to do this. Email was sent to me. And so when I do that, because it happens. I mean, even this last few weeks when I've been really trying to implement this, some things are just too big for me. So when they happen, then I just, I can't see the ball. It's just... And then I repent. Then I'm like, oh God, I'm, I, I, I... I didn't avert this. I received this. Oh God. I now release this ball and I pass it on to you. Would you please go and score the try? Because I'm definitely going to knock it. Um, so I trust God for this discernment to see the ball coming. If this makes sense to any of you, is there anyone that thinks, oh, this, this discernment of the temptation coming would be quite, would be quite cool and makes a lot of sense. I'd like to, I just want to do a quick prayer. Is there anyone that thinks this might be helpful? Yeah. Okay. Father, I thank you that um, you would give us this discernment. Father, I pray that what you've given me in this regard, that you would give to all of us, Father, who longs in our hearts, Father, to see this, this attack of the enemy coming on our lives. Father, I pray that we would be able to know it and see it, realize it, recognize it, smile at it, and pass it on to you, Lord. I pray for that grace. Pray for that discernment to be on us in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, do not fret because it leads only to evil, but you know my life. I am quite holy, and I contend for very holy things. Why aren't you laughing? <laughs> um, but I do want to believe that I want good things to happen. That's my life. I want to see good things happen. And all of us do. And so often we think, but I am anxious for good. I am anxious to see the kingdom of God extend to the furthest part of the world. And therefore, I shall be anxious. You know, I want to see all men saved, so I shall be anxious. I want to be an amazing husband to my wife, so I shall be anxious for good. And then as I looked at the scripture, I said, if I am anxious, I won't spend this much time on every scripture, but 
I like this one a, a lot. Um, if I'm anxious about good, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, you are you making you making you making double work for yourself. Because now you're 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 being anxious about the good thing you want to come is only leading to evil in the good thing that you want to see happen. So it's not gonna make it any bit better. And now you have to work double as hard to ensure that what you want it to be a good is actually good. Because you just made it more evil because with your worrying. Because it leads only to evil. Now, science tells us this, that when we are anxious and anxious and stressed and stressed and stressed, what happens? We get sick and we die. No jokes. Most, most sicknesses are related back to that. The enemy's work is to come and steal, kill, and destroy. It destroys our careers, destroys our marriages, destroys our lives, destroys our bodies. It leads to evil. It's a great reason for me to not even be anxious for good and to know that when I see some, when, when I want to see something good happen, I should not be at this place. But as scripture says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. That should be the place from where, from where I birth good. And for some of us, this is an easy command and it just sounds like a nice blessing. For some of us, we had a great space in our life and we're like, okay, cool. So now, you know, if I encounter some hectic stuff in the future, I'll know, like, this is not, I'm not going to receive it. Right now, I am not either, but if it comes, I won't. But I know a lot of us are and have been dealing with major things. A lot of us are in big roles in the companies that we're in. A lot of us are entrepreneurs in the companies that we're in. A lot of us have got issues on all kinds of levels, like I do, and thought patterns have been entrenched. And therefore, this commandment like this is just not that easy, to be honest. But it still is a commandment. And imagine life if we could obey it. That's our good God. It's almost like Sabbath. He said, you will rest. You will not do anything. You will just rest and have a great time. It's like, no, don't be such a harsh God. Don't say we should rest and just enjoy it. You know, we're like that too. We're like, no, rest. Can't rest. I have to work harder and harder. It's like, you think he's a harsh God and actually he's just saying, my son, my daughter, what are you doing? I want you to know me and uh, I want you to embrace the life that I've given and that I've died for you to have. So that's the command, right? Next one is the action plan. So what do I do? And we see this a couple of times too. Psalm 55 is 22. The first part of it says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. So when that ball comes, all the more now during this sermon, that ball is not a round ball anymore. It's becoming more like an oval, oval ball. Uh, so I can pass it. So I'm, I'm going to see oval balls in the future. So it's more like a rugby game. Um, and then I, he says, take that thing and cast it on me. And I will sustain you. He acknowledges that these things come to us. He acknowledges that they come, but we should then know what to do with them. And rather to go, kaboom, we go, it's yours, God. And I literally smile. I literally smile as I do that and just pass it. And there's more about this that's going to come, that's going to add to the action plan but we seriously need to learn how to fold the mail and how, how to pass the ball and so if it happens to you there's and this is the wonder of the the beauty of the action plan is there's something to do you're not a helpless victim don't go into self-pity Repent. And I know for some of you that's a negative word, but that's the work of the devil because repentance is the most beautiful, sweetest word that there is. That's life. It's where we find life in our in our faith. 
You can say, oh God, I have, I'm, I'm changing the way I'm thinking about this now. And I'm going to pass it all on to you because I'm not allowed to have it. I'm not allowed to have anxiety in my life. You said that when I started working for you as a junior. And then there comes the promise. Um, I took this one from John 14, verse 27. It's Jesus who says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. The world says remove the stressor. The stressor, Jesus says the stressors will come, but I sleep in the boat while the storm is raging and I don't understand what your issue is because perfect peace is inside and he can do that even while you are burning at the stake. Are you with me? Worldly peace is linked to your circumstance, not the one that Jesus gives you. This world does not allow this peace also. Its devices are against it but the peace from the prince of peace we read, we read in Isaiah 9 he's the prince of peace and it says to the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end I want an ever increasing peace in me and the prince of peace gives that praise God A little ad break when i was at high school i couldn't sleep because i was too i was too fearful uh, we lived on a farm and like with stories of farm murders and stuff i was lying awake every night thinking oh it's gonna happen i couldn't sleep i was so fearful for so many things and um I had a couple of other issues I, I also stuttered for those of you who do not know i couldn't speak at all i didn't do orals i didn't read out loud I didn't do anything i couldn't say a word i was and um you can look on YouTube. I shared a the testimony there if you want to hear how it happened. So the little scar of it I have left that you'd hear every now and again is just a reminder of what God has done. But I, I, I remember back then how I thought in my life that that fear, sleeping, not being able to sleep because of it, and not being able to say what you want to say ever, ever, is imp it's impossible possible for that to ever be removed you come to that place you say this is just it i mean I, I i can't see any way of getting out of this pit this is just how it is and i remember having that thought and if i think back on that thought now i sleep like a baby and i speak for a living and if i think on my anxiety now and i think i cannot for the life of me i cannot imagine being in the perfect peace of God. He promises perfect peace. You'll see in that other scripture, perfect peace. But I've seen enough of the faithfulness of God to know that I can have it also. And he can do it. And life can be like that in him. He died for it. So I want to stir your faith. It doesn't have to be the way it is. He wants to give us a safeguard to our heart, even when we're burned on the stake or when our business goes under, that cannot shake us. Now we're going to run this cycle again. We just went through a command, action plan, promise cycle. The command is don't be anxious. The action plan is give it to God. The promise is amazing peace. We're going to run through it again. More from the New Testament now. I think all of it would be New Testament. I know I worked one in from the Old Testament just to make sure it's balanced. Um, that's, just, that's also just a joke. Um, Matthew 6, 34. Here comes the command again. Oh, what a beautiful scripture. We often read Matthew uh, 6, 25 to 33. It starts with therefore. So, 25 starts with therefore, and then it explains the whole thing, and it ends with this beautiful climax that says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. Okay? Ends there. And then comes a sneaky verse 34, just before 7-1. It says, oh, I'm not going to go to 7-1, but 634 says, Therefore, so there's another therefore on that therefore. So it kind of summarizes everything in there. It is therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. 
I like to tell tomorrow that. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know what, my dear friend? God knows that we cannot handle tomorrow's worries today without being anxious. And he doesn't want us to live in anxiety. I've realized we don't have the capacity to be anxious about tomorrow and the day after and live a healthy and peaceful life. And it contravenes the word of God. What a blessing. Can you even comprehend such a life? I'm trying my very best. I said, God, but what about all my dreams and the plans and the hopes for the future and blah, 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 blah. And he said, yes, for plans. Yes, for hopes. Yes, for being excited. No to being anxious. He doesn't say, don't be excited for tomorrow. It says, but don't be anxious. Don't worry. Let it worry about itself. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. I'm like, it's good for me to realize my inability, scripture tells us, to be worried about tomorrow and then to live a peaceful life. So we have to let go. This was quite cool for me. I hope it means something to some of you too. You need to let go of that. You need to let go of those thoughts of tomorrow that stresses you out. You need to let go of that that happens in your tummy when you start to think about what's going to happen tomorrow. And you think right now, some of you think it's, Im it's impossible to live in a way where I do not do that. Well, it isn't. And our Father in heaven wants us to live without it. And I've often told God, God, the yoke is hard and the burden is heavy. I experience it. I'm like, oh God, I'm in ministry. It's so hard. It's so heavy. And yes, it is. But scripture said it shouldn't be. He says, yeah, because you're trying to be Jesus. You're trying to pick up all these things of tomorrow and of next year and of the following season and of blah, 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 blah. And you've let go of just being a little boy that's excited with his father and you have picked it up and put it on your shoulders and you refuse to forward the mail to your father. So I want to declare to you that if you're anxious about tomorrow, it's against the will of God. It seems. The adrenaline for today is good as long as it's appropriate to the situation. I have got adrenaline in me every Sunday morning when I know I need to come to preach, but that adrenaline is good. I reminded myself this morning, I get to minister. It's super cool. And then I'm slightly anxious for today. And I use that adrenaline and I smile through it rather than to stumble over my wife and my children and be um, irritated with them. How, how can a pastor ever be irritated with his wife and his children before he comes to preach? And then the Holy Spirit dropped this on me. I hope some of these snippets, I hope you can kind of catch some of these snippets and write them down because I, I realize that some of them would hit home for some of you and you need to take that. Okay, so there's a lot of small things within this process for some of you it's a nice process for other of you it's a little snippet but i believe the holy spirit told me the one morning when i was on uh, paternity leave and i spent time with my uh, new baby daughter and my son and my wife and i felt god say worrying about tomorrow drastically reduces your ability to love today actually it removes your it removes a lot of capacity in your heart to love today and loving today is the activity with the most eternal impact you can engage in today so just get rid of that stuff 
And often I would feel like I'm, I'm so focused and anxious for tomorrow and for what's going to need to happen. I'm so focused on it. I'm, I'm stumbling in an abstract way over my wife and my children because they also need to be dealt with now while I'm heading there. God is saying, stop that. Love now. Your worrying about tomorrow drastically reduces your capacity to love today. The Holy Spirit is so faithful. And you know what? Tomorrow is not <laughs> metaphoric for your retirement. We like to speak about tomorrow. I'm planning for my tomorrow. No. Scripture speaks about the day after now. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So don't only not worry about your retirement, but also don't worry about tomorrow. Imagine we could do this. I believe we can. So we, we focus on loving well each day. Repent about uh, tomorrow anxieties and hand them to God. The command is do not be anxious, Matthew. The action plan 1 Peter 5, 7, probably referring to the psalmist saying, it's Peter saying, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. There he is again. Pass the ball for the email. Cast it on him. He cares for you. He knows anxieties will kill you. Stress will kill you ill you so he wants to take it from you because he's a good father he says pass me the ball i care for you not pass me the ball because you are a failure not pass me the ball because you can't handle it not pass me the ball um because i'd rather do it than not have you do it no don't go to that mode we like that mode no pass me the ball because he cares for you Imagine you had a manager like that who cared for you and just wanted you to forward him all the hard emails and love to just sort it out for you. And then the promise, here it comes again. Isaiah 26.3, one of my favorite scriptures, links to my previous sermon that um, many of you were away for the long weekend. You can go listen to it, but... You will keep him in perfect peace. Perfect peace. Who wants it? Oh, hallelujah. Me too. Perfect peace. Are you kidding me? It's possible on earth. You will keep him in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Perfect peace even from the Old Testament. The old covenant that Matthew taught us, there's a better covenant now. But even in the old covenant, there's a promise of perfect peace. We've received the new covenant. We've got the Holy Spirit inside of us. Imagine how perfect this peace can be. Listen to that sermon I preached on the continual conversation with God. It's been a great help to me in those instances where I pass the ball. It's not only a, like a blind pass, like, um, like, uh, like um, my impi received when he scored that World Cup try. Have you seen he, um, What's his name? Who was the center? You actually gave him... Like a blind pause, like a no looker, and then he caught the ball and he won the World Cup. But anyway, it's not a no looker pass. It's a I look to God. And in that moment, I converse with him. And the thing about the Father is Jesus already died for our sins. And when every time when we engage him, we think he's going to have something harsh to say. And then he's got the most amazing things to say. And he speaks love over you. And you're like, this can't be. This isn't true. This, And then again and again and again and again, when you engage him, when you dare to engage him, he loves you. 
And I can imagine that you will keep him in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Anxiety says that I will trust in me. Anxiety says I'm trusting in me or others. You must learn to trust in God. That's the only way to perfect peace. I will not trust in horses. I will not trust in chariots. I will not trust in me. We should stop that. And perfect peace will be with us. So we ran through the cycle twice now. And now we're going to see it put all together. All comes together in Philippians 4. Let's look at that. The third time we read all of this. All right. With its unique emphasis. Number one, do not be anxious about anything. It's a, it's a command. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Action plan, pass the ball. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ, in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, the promise. The command, the action plan, the promise. Scripture is clear on this to me. There's much more about this in Scripture, and we'll explore this in the weeks coming. This is clear to me. And it makes sense to me. And it's liberating me at the moment. We've got these commands from David and Paul and Jesus. David and Paul and Jesus all saying, do not. I was looking for one from Moses. I thought if I could, if I could find Moses writing somewhere, do not be anxious. Then I'd have all the big, all, all the big voices would have said it, you know. Jesus himself echoing the other writers says, do not be anxious, my precious child. The action and what this scripture adds to that um, pass is almost that interaction. And so it's not only the email coming in and I'm passing it, but the, that email, unlike in a work context, that email's got a lot to do with me and it's got a great impact on me most of the time when it's a real life situation. So it's not as easy as just, as, just, as just passing it on. So I make known to God, what is my desire from this? What is my need in this? And then that complete package, so it's almost that ball that came to me with a couple of notes that I sent on. And it's a split second thing. This is, this is not a, like Paul's going into meditative state for half an hour every time you receive an email like that. Ah, it's a split second thing. It's like a t -t -t smile. And you, you and God know the transaction that just happened. Isn't that cool? All comes together. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So we're going to quickly do that right now. I know it's 11 o'clock, but I'm sure we can quickly give this a go. The three steps as I put it there is adhere to the command. Give it to God, smile, and breathe and receive. Smiling and breathing helps a lot. You're telling your body that it's, it's okay. So, um, if Jeannie, you can maybe quickly come to the front. That would be nice. We've, we've already prayed for the discerning of those temptations to become real. Um, you, you don't have to put the next slide up low. I'll just, just have it here for my, my own sake. But, um, What I want you to do and um, is maybe just quickly in two minutes, we'll do a um, 10 minute ministry. So we'll be done by 10 past 11, is that fine? Just setting a boundary so you know, okay? I want you to share with those around you and you can remove the three steps now, low, and just go do the slide 
before that, maybe go to this Isaiah 26 3 slide because I really like that scripture. Yeah. Anyway, so quickly discuss among each other in one to two minutes what are those three steps? What of it makes sense to you? What are you what are you what are you getting out of that? Um, and 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 how does it how could that practically actually actually be done by you? Just quickly have a discussion about those three steps, what they are and what you think they can mean for you.